the quote, the quote is from Nelson Mandela. And it says, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. But I also talk to you about Martin Luther King and He's the one that popularized an idea that came from early in the 1900s by a philosopher. He says, our goal is to create a beloved community and that will require a qualitative change in our souls as well as a quantitative change in our lives. And his wife, Coretta Scott King, in running the King Center, the memorial institution that she founded to further the goals of her husband, Martin Luther King, <clears throat> They announced that Dr. King's beloved community is a global vision in which all people can share in the wealth of the earth. In the beloved community, poverty, hunger, and homelessness will not be tolerated because international standards of human decency will not allow it. Racism and all forms of discrimination, bigotry, and prejudice will be replaced by an all-inclusive spirit of sisterhood and brotherhood. And I thought, but we use that term often. As you use, as Clayton Memorial, you use, we repeat that each week as we remind ourselves of our, the affirmations and our agreement on how we're going to be. And it's in that search to be, to create, to become the beloved community. And I thought, but it's just making that commitment enough. And I decided I was going to do a little more research. I was going to find out a little bit more about why that was important, why strategically that was the solution to get us to that place of peace. Is there any more information that can help us? And then I was glad and sad at the same time. I was glad for those that have gone beyond before us to give us some crumbs to take us to the rabbit trails that'll help us get back to that place, if we've ever been there at all, that we describe as the beloved community. So I was grateful for the wisdom of people like Martin Luther King and the Nelson Mandela's and many others, the Gandhi's that have helped to light the way. But then I was saddened because as I read some of the references, what was the rest of the story that he was talking about when he said, therefore, we need to become the beloved community. And I was saddened because many of the words of Martin Luther King were written in the early 1960s. That was 60 years ago. And as I was reading through some of his speeches this week, I was saddened to realize that the same message is what's needed today. I was glad that I'm a UU pastor, an interfaith minister where we have principles that say, your search for truth is your responsibility. I'll let you in on something. As a pastor, that takes the responsibility off of me to decide what you believe, to decide how you process the situations that you face, to decide which side of the fence you stand on when we have issues in the world that show up, issues that will conflict your values. Yes, I'm on this side, but wait a minute, am I really? You see, as an interfaith minister, that responsibility is yours. But we're here to give you some insight, some crumbs, some wisdom that you can then use to make decisions for how you see taking that journey to the beloved community. 
And so today with those conflicting emotions, I wanted to give you a history lesson in the beloved community from the words of Martin Luther King. I wanted to give you some perspective because it gave me a broader basket of tools to use as I think through how today, specifically, I can become a better citizen in that beloved community. And in this search, let me tell you what I found. There were two sermons that seemed to almost fit together seamlessly. The first sermon he called Facing the Challenge of a New Age. And he gave that in a place called Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, November, this time of year, 1962. But he also gave another speech that he entitled The Birth of a New Nation. It was delivered on April 7th, 1957, where he first mentioned the beloved community. And I wanna share some of the words from both of these sermons. And so with full disclosure, these are the words of someone else. You can call them prophetic words, you can call them inspiration, you can call them nothing at all if you choose. But these words for me were powerful as I rethought again about our beloved community to realize that it really is a global community that we're talking about. And so today, these words, he started this sermon in 1957. And he said, I want to preach on a sermon called The Birth of a Nation. And he began talking about the story of Exodus and of the bondage. And he said he had the privilege of going and watching in New York City a brand new movie called The Ten Commandments. 1957, I bet some of you know which version that was. He says, the struggle of Moses, the struggle of the devoted followers as they sought to get out of Egypt, and they finally moved on to the wilderness and towards the promised land. This is something of the story of every people struggling for freedom. It is the first story of man's explicit quest for freedom, and it demonstrates the stages that seem to inevitably follow the quest for freedom. And he began in this sermon to talk about a place back then in the 50s that was called the Gold Coast. He went on to talk about this place in West Africa that we now know as Ghana. And he gave me a history lesson on how we got there and why that tied into the beloved community. He said, you also know that for years and for centuries, Africa has been one of the most exploited continents in the history of the world. It's been the dark continent. It's been the continent that has suffered all of the pain and the affliction that could be mustered up by other nations. And it's a continent in which has experienced slavery, which has experienced all of the lowest standards that we can think about. And it has been brought into being by the exploitation inflicted upon it by other nations. He went on to give the history of how long and who had come and taken over the people and the resources. And he goes on to say, finally, in 1850, Britain won out and she gained possession of the total territorial expansion of the Gold Coast. And he goes on and he says, there seems to be a long story of history, this repeated kind of way that we do. But he says, there also seems to be a throbbing desire there seems to be an internal desire for freedom within the soul of every man. And it's there. It might not break forth in the beginning, but eventually it breaks out. Men realize that freedom is something basic. To take from him his freedom is to rob him of God's image. He goes on and says, there is something in the soul that cries out for freedom. There is something deep down within the very soul of man that reaches out for Canaan. Men cannot be satisfied with Egypt. They try to adjust to it for a while. Many men have vested interest in Egypt and they are slow to leave. Egypt makes it profitable to them. Some people profit by Egypt. 
The vast majority, the masses of people never profit by Egypt and they're never content with it. And eventually the, they rise up and begin to cry out for Canaan's land. And he was speaking in that time in the 50s and he was speaking about the Gold Coast and he said, British said that they would never let them go from that bondage that they held him in. And he went on to give those listening a history lesson but as he came around to the conclusion of that sermon in the 50s, 57, he says, so the day finally came and it was a great day because what he was there in Ghana to witness was the ending of the old era where they had received their freedom. He said, so that day finally came. It was a great day. The week ahead was a great week. They had been preparing for this day for many years and now. It was there. He talked about the people that came from all around the globe to celebrate this independence. And he repeats the words that they greeted the new leader with. He says, we want to greet you and we want you to know that you have our moral support as you grow. They watched the British flag go down and the new flag of Ghana go up. And he likened this to that story from Christian scriptures about the slaves finally getting to the promised land, leaving bondage, leaving the bondage. And he said he witnessed a new Ghana coming into being. It was the birth of a new nation. He said this nation was now out of Egypt and had crossed the Red Sea. Now it will confront the wilderness because see the work wasn't done. He says, like any breaking loose from Egypt, there is a wilderness ahead. There is a problem of adjustment and their president realized that. There is always this wilderness standing before them. But he continued. He used the imagery of a promised land, this place that we haven't arrived at yet. And he says there were some things that he learned from the birth of this new nation that we must never forget about this process of leaving bondage, whatever that bondage may be. He said, things we must never forget as we find ourselves breaking loose from an evil Egypt, trying to move through the wilderness towards the promised land. For him at the time, it was cultural integration. He says, first, the oppressor will never voluntarily give freedom to the oppressed. You have to work for it says the oppressor has you in dominion because he plans to keep you there and he never voluntarily gives it up. And that is where the strong resistance comes. Privileged classes never give up their privilege without resistance. He was talking about Montgomery, the bus boycotts had just become a part of this movement. He says, if we wait for it to work itself out, it'll never be worked out. Freedom only comes through persistent revolt, through persistent agitation, through persistently rising up against the system of evil. It would be fortunate if the people in power had sense enough to go on and give up, but they don't do it like that. It is not done voluntarily, but it is done through the pressure, the pressure that comes about from people who are oppressed. He says, there's another thing that I can learn. It reminds us of the fact that a nation or a people can break loose from oppression without violence. In the beginning, he says, he had studied Gandhi's work, but he could not see how they could ever get loose from colonialism without armed revolt, without armies and ammunition rising up. This was the president of Ghana that he reflected on hearing this. And then he retells the story and he says, but the president then said, then he says, after he continued to study Gandhi and continued to study this technique, he came to see that the only way through was through nonviolent positive action. He called his program positive action. He said they got free through nonviolent means. We've got to revolt in such a way that after revolt is over, and these are the words of Martin Luther King, we can live with people as their brothers and sisters. Our aim must never be to defeat them or humiliate them. 
these two nations will be able to live together and work together because the breaking of loose was through nonviolence and not through violence. And here's where the quote comes from. Martin Luther continued and he said, the aftermath of nonviolence is the creation of the beloved community. The aftermath of nonviolence is redemption. The aftermath of nonviolence is reconciliation. The aftermath of violence are emptiness and bitterness. He said, this is the thing I'm concerned about. Let us fight passionately and unrelentingly for the goals of justice and peace, but let's make sure that our hands are clean in this struggle. Let us never fight with falsehood and violence and hate and malice, but always fight with love so that when the day comes, for him it was the walls of segregation come down. For us today, those walls are different. He says, let our hands be clean so that when those walls of oppression fall, we will be able to live with people as their brothers and sisters. We must come to the point of seeing that our ultimate aim is to live with all men as brothers and sisters under God and not be their enemies or anything that goes with that type of relation. That still is not really a popular message, that nonviolence, that love wins out. But he went on and he talked in 1962, so this is five years later and not many years before his death. He gave a speech that said, that called it Facing the New Age. And he talked about change. He talked about a change that came about as the result of our loving interactions with each other. He talked about the kind of change that was about bringing peace and not destructions. He said that each and every individual must be something of a creative obstetrician presiding at the birth of a new age, willing to engage in nonviolent direct action and that supplements what we can do through the courts and other means. He gave a quote in this particular sermon. He says, if a man is 30 or 33, as I happen to be, he was 33 at the time, facing some great challenge and truth, some great creative opportunity, some great need to stand up for what is right. And yet he is afraid to do it because he fears that he may lose a job or that house will get bombed or that he will be killed and he wants to live a few more years. He may live until he's 80, but he is just as dead at 33 as he is as 80 and just as tainted. Somehow the cessation of breathing in his life is merely the belated announcement of an earlier death of the spirit. He died when he fa failed to take a stand for what is right. This is what nonviolence says to every individual who stands up in the struggle that some things are so great and dear that for him they were worth dying for. In the words that he gave us, I thought about what is that message for us today? 1957, 1962, he was talking about the United States. He was talking about the injustices where people were not seen for who they are. And he quoted a poem, John Cooper in the 1700s, wasn't a black man, wasn't a slave, but he talked about the difference of our skin and hair being the only obvious differences and that we all feel we're all one. And that what hurts one of us hurts us all. Martin Luther King talked about us living in a time where technology has connected us. We're witnessing that today. I'm sitting in South America, you're sitting in North America, yet we're talking in near real time with each other. 
I see you and you see me. He says we're already a global community. What's left is we must become a global brotherhood. In this modern age, I heard that word and I thought he was talking from a time where that male centeredness calls us a brotherhood. But a brotherhood in his words would have included us all, both male and female, both black and whites and browns and reds and yellows. These were words where he was talking to us. He was saying, it's possible. Look at Ghana. When I read that story, I thought back to our Women's History Month. Edhuwana, the high priestess of the God of Wisdom, the first father, her father, emperor of the Fertile, uh, fertile Crescent, the first of his kind to take on that empire style taking over. And her words then as the goddess of wisdom were that war is evil. It's painful, it's destructive, it sheds blood unnecessarily. But we don't have to single out any particular country today. Look at all of us all of us that participate in societies who still haven't learned so good how to resolve our conflict in ways that don't take us to violence. You don't have to look outside of American soil to find evidence of this. If I dare turn on the news or YouTube there's a new shooting that's taken place. There's a new conflict that's been resolved with violence in some way, whether it be taking something from a convenience store or the gas station or spraying innocent people at a mall or a church or a festival or in the streets. Our world has become a place where I think we're losing hope that nonviolence and love can win. But the words of Martin Luther King have said, if you use violence to solve the problem, the problem isn't solved. And so today, not my job to tell you how to look at the world but it is a responsibility that I've taken on to give you some wisdom for the journey. We are already a global community. What affects one of us affects us all. Our lack of resolution for our conflicts by peaceful means has the potential, turn on the news, real potential to affect us all. And then he gives a simple formula. We must be the beloved community, which we, all of us, we must be those people who learn to resolve conflict with peace, with love, so that when the conflict is resolved, that we can live together with each other as brothers and sisters. He painted that picture with Ghana in the way that they were able to leave and the experience he had at the inaugural celebrations, the night of this shift where the flag of Britain went down, but that the president of Britain was dancing with the princess from Britain, that they had resolved the conflict in a way that was not armies solving it. And that he mentioned that as a reflection for the possibilities and the hope that he held on to even to his death and beyond in these words. And his words were, after nonviolent communication is used to resolve the conflict, even the more we need the beloved community. When do you think is a good time for that beloved community to be ready for that change? If you believe that that change is not only possible, but essential 
Are you readying yourself to be the beloved community? Martin Luther King says, once resolution happens, we've got to be that community so that there is the new world where old things pass away. Which old things need to pass away? The attitudes and the values that say peace and love aren't the way. And he started one of his sermons by using that scripture that even today is being fought about. He says, many, many centuries ago, a man named John was in prison out on a lonely, obscure island called Patmos. And in such a situation, he was deprived of almost every freedom but the freedom to think. He thought about many things. He thought about the old Jerusalem. But in the midst of all of this, he lifted his vision to heaven. He saw a new earth, new heaven, a new Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. And if you'll turn over in the book of Revelations, Martin Luther King said to his audience, you will find these words, behold, I will make all things new. The former things are passed away. And in a real sense, those of us who have lived through some of the 20th century and into the 21st century, for me, I'm able to say with John, I'd like to see a new heaven and a new earth. I'd like to see an order where the old things are passed away and a new order is coming into being. But I challenge you that that's not going to happen without us being that change. And so today, my challenge to you again is that we must be citizens of the beloved community. There's a song that I want to share. He's a regular guy. I don't know who this man is. Posted his music on YouTube, but I thought, isn't it about the regular folks? And his words are timely as well. And so Marsha, if you would play that closing song. <laughs> 